Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, August 18th, 2023. It's good to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, 150 years now, the members of the Naval Institute have been the foundation of everything we do, from proceedings to naval history to USNI news, professional books, conferences and events. If you enjoy the show, ring the bell, subscribe, recommend us to your friends, and become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org forward slash join. There are a couple of really cool events coming up in October at the Institute, so put these on your calendar. First off is our 150th birthday celebration, 9 October. That is 150 years to the day from the founding uh, of the Naval Institute at the Naval Academy uh, on that, uh, that October day when uh, Admiral Warden and, uh, and 15 others decided that the uh, Navy needed a group outside the, uh, the chain of command to, uh, to develop the ideas and the concepts and the tactics and the leadership that would propel the Navy and the sea services forward. The other event is on 25 October, we have our annual um, event that we do with the Naval Academy and it will be in our Jack C. Taylor Conference Center uh, Auditorium and it's titled Critical Thinking, Our Greatest Weapon to Winning Tomorrow's War. So both of those events are open to the public. There is a, um, uh, a cost for the birthday celebration because that is a, uh, a fundraiser for the Naval Institute. There is no cost uh, for uh, coming to the Critical Thinking Conference uh, on the 25th of October. And we've got some uh, very cool speakers for the, uh, the 25 October event. Former Secretary of Defense General Jim Mattis uh, will be one of the speakers. Invited is uh, Mr. Eric Schmidt, the, one of the co-founders and CEOs of Google, uh, now Alphabet. And uh, so he is uh, invited as, as well as a number of panelists and, uh, and experts on education, on critical thinking, on, on how good critical thinking uh, informs and develops and propels an organization uh, forward. So that should be a good event. Okay, so let's get to our guest now. I'm very excited to have uh, joining us from Camp Pendleton, California, Commander Kelsey Berrien, U.S. Coast Guard. She is the winner of this year's Naval Institute Coast Guard Essay Contest. And her article is titled, The Elephant in the Engine Room. It appears on pages 16 to 21 of the August issue, if you get the print issue. And of course, it's available online as well at usni.org forward slash proceedings. Uh, so Kelsey, Congratulations and welcome to the show. Thanks, Bill. It's great to be here. Uh, so your article starts with a quote that I'll just read here. It says, if the Coast Guard wants its engineers to be brilliant on the basics of shipboard maintenance, it must adapt its training and assignment process. So can you elaborate on that a bit? And what is the elephant in the engine room as you see it? Sure, Bill. Um, so I, I think when you you know you look at the commandant strategy and the the page of it, it's a it's a beautiful spread with lots of pictures. And the page that talks about being brilliant at the basics, it has this picture of a couple of our guys in a small boat, um, probably going out to rescue somebody in a flood. And I think that's the kind of thing that comes to mind when most people hear we need to get brilliant at the Coast Guard basics. You know, driving boats, driving ships, doing search and rescue, um, those essential skills. But we can't have really good ship drivers and boat drivers if we haven't done the maintenance to keep the platforms underneath them operating so that they're able to to do what they're designed to do. And so the kind of irony of being an engineer is that success for us is when nobody's thinking about us, right? Like you don't want to be the engineer on the bridge explaining why the lights are out, the props not turning, um, you know, the, the toilets aren't flushing, whatever it is. Success for us is when everything's humming and we're going about our daily business and nobody's thinking about, about what we're doing. So it makes it a little bit hard to communicate what's going on with us because the, the world of shipboard engineering is not well understood most of the time by the folks that aren't living and working in it. And we're, we're kind of out of sight, out of mind when everything's good. So we, we have that piece of it. Um, and, and then on the other side of it, we have what I kind of see as a second order effect of buying highly automated ships. 
And, and we went from these platforms that you know are super dependable and have run for decades upon decades, the 378s that we've decommissioned, the 270s, the 210s that we're getting ready to decommission. Um, and, and we're able to keep them running in part because of some of the simplicity in how they were designed. And we made some changes, and, and it would be foolish of us not to, but we made some changes towards more highly automated things. And you know, the brief example that I can give is that like every ship needs a lube oil purifier. Well, it used to be 40 or 50 years ago, the lube oil purifier had to have somebody come by every four hours and the watchstander had to operate a sequence of valves to send it through a cleaning cycle to make sure that it continued to do what it was supposed to do. And the lube oil purifiers now, they do that by themselves. They got solenoids, they have water sensors, they have a whole bunch of other things in there that enable them to automatically detect when that process is needed, do it on demand. And it's great because it takes the burden off of our watchstanders. But the second order effect of that is that when something breaks in that and it's not doing what it's supposed to, there's now a whole larger world, not just of the fluid side of it, but the solenoids and the electrical controls and the signals that are in there that you now need to know as a maintainer in order to be able to get it back up and running. And so the things that are there that make a ship a ship on paper are still there. We still have main propulsion engines of various types. We still have the air compressors. We still have all the things that we had on the older platforms, but on the newer ones, they're an order of magnitude more complicated. Um, and the training processes for this then become by necessity deeper. You need to spend more time because you don't just have to learn the internal combustion engine process. You now also have to learn how that engine's digital governor is working. Because before we could talk about weights and, and hydraulic power and some of the other things, and some of that's still there. But now we also have a processing unit on the front of the engines that's doing an awful lot of thinking very quickly to make that engine run as efficiently as possible. And so the gap, you know, the elephant that I talk about is that gap where, where the ships are modernizing, but our processes and our approach to the people side of it um, haven't quite caught up to what we need. And the way that you can that you can tell some of this is because the little things that ideally should be caught early and should be, you know, addressed quickly, promptly, something that should be a recognizable symptom now becomes a big deal. Uh, because the folks that are in there don't have um, don't have the the background training or the in depth knowledge to be able to um, take care of them when they come up. Yeah, no, those are great points. Um, uh, I want to just point out that your background is a bit different than than most Coast Guard officers uh, because you graduated from the Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, where midshipmen focus either on engineering pathway or or the deck slash navigation and you were in the engineering um, concentration and so talk a little bit about how that frames the way you look at engineering in the coast guard sure um I, as you mentioned i was an engineer and like every king's point midshipman i spent one out of my four years at sea and it's uh it's kind of an intermixed thing you do some uh, some classes, some cadet shipping time, some classes, some cadet shipping time, and then you come back for some final rounds of classes and you graduate. Um, I went to a bunch of different types of ship as a cadet, but one of the things that I was able to do was I made a, uh, I made a short deployment on the mighty warship Thetis. And so it was really cool because that was kind of my introduction to, you know, this is Coast Guard engineering and this is how the Coast Guard does it. Um, the thing that I did a little bit differently is when I graduated, I went straight into the reserve. And so I did some Ports, Waterways, Coastal Security stuff for the Coast Guard in my reserve job, but I joined uh, MEBA, which is a Marine Engineers Union. And I actually went to sea for about 10 years commercially before I came on active duty with the Coast Guard. And so in those 10 years, I've worked oil tankers, container ships, uh, some ready reserve stuff, even a cruise ship, different plants, everything from steam to diesel electric, different ages, um, and I've gotten I've gotten to see some of the different approaches, not only to maintenance, but to hiring, you know, from the, the super budget low end to the very invested high end um, and seeing how those things have worked. And when I came on active duty with the Coast Guard, uh, I jumped into shore support, which, you know, kind of felt like a natural fit, even though it was it was jumping from the ship side to the shore side and in a different organization. Um, 
And so when I came in, I asked a lot of, of why questions, you know, why do we do this this way? And why do we do this this way? And I got a lot of solid answers and I, I started understanding what the different concerns were for military ships and a, a larger organization rather than just a commercial company that may have a dozen ships at most. Um, so that, that kind of started to give what the interests were. I was still hung up on a couple of things though. Um, and I've been, I've been kicking them around for a while. And then last year I had the opportunity to go visit a Canadian Coast Guard vessel and talk with their crews. And that was a really interesting experience because they've taken a merchant approach where everyone on board is licensed to the appropriate level for their position. And the, um, the crews follow that kind of merchant model where every ship has two crews and they, they rotate 28 days on 28 days off. And so it was interesting to hear from them and know that there were other similar organizations that were taking a vastly different approach and had been for a couple of decades. Um, and then, you know, doing some more looking into that, I found that a lot of the world's navies and coast guards follow that approach as well. And so I was able to, to talk with them and get some insight there. And then last summer, um, I spent a few months filling in as an engineer officer on a national security cutter. And that really kind of crystallized it for me because I was able to um, see the deck plate, you know, all the way from the deck plate to the shore side and put all of that together. Um, and that kind of gave me the, the outside perspective or the, the, I'm sorry, the inside perspective to go with my outside perspective to be able to put all the pieces uh, together to write the article that I did. Yeah, which uh, national security cutter were you on last year? I'm sorry, I was on Stratton. Stratton, got it. Yeah, and just just for a few months. Um, you know, the the permanent EO had some medical stuff, and so I was able to I was able to really spend that time, and that was where I started to really see how much of a burden it put on our enlisted folks to be running things the way that we were. But with that whole out of sight, out of mind, typically thing, um, it's a it's a burden that doesn't get picked up well or messaged well outside the community. Yeah, you, you bring up the uh, Canadian Coast Guard and I'm reminded of an article we published a few months ago uh, by Commander Brooke Millard, who's the commanding officer of uh, Coast Guard Cutter Bear. And she was mm -hmm. one of our uh, federal executive fellows at the Naval Institute a few years ago. So I'm a huge fan of Brooke. But um, she was uh, talking about the experience of taking her cutter uh, north for a, a multinational exercise up, uh, you know, above the Arctic Circle and in the high, you know, Atlantic, North Atlantic. Uh, and, and some of the things that she picked up from other, uh, other Coast Guards and other navies, how they, as you point out, mm -hmm. the, the Canadian model with the two crews, other, uh, other Coast Guards have that model as well. The, some of the grooming standards were different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some of the, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the, the way they look at some of the social issues that we, you know, it was just different, right? It was a, being mm -hmm. able to share that perspective of how other Coast Guards do things. Even if you decide, if our Coast Guard and Navy decide not to do what other navies and Coast Guards have done, it's always good to look at things from a different perspective and say, huh, we don't do that. And, you know, we shouldn't uh, or huh, we don't do that. Maybe we should think about that. Maybe we should examine that that model. So, yeah, it's a it's a great example. Um, I read that article with great fascination. Um, I thought it was really interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, to hear the, you know, what I kind of considered the bridge comparison to what I've seen in the end. Yeah, right. And, it, you know, it, putting in a plug for the reservists, I think this is one of the things that that we can bring to the table with the organizations is, you know, we've we've worked in those experiments. I've I've lived firsthand those different types of crewing and manning strategies. And, you know, we can bring the best of those to our other organizations, to the Coast Guard and and hopefully make all of them better in the process. Great points. Uh, so you've got a number of recommendations in your article too, as we, as you say, shrink the elephant. So let's talk about a few of them, starting with the, the first one is implement quasi specialization of engineering rates. So what do you mean by that? Well, one of the things that, that struck me, um, you know, looking at the span of what our machinery technicians, especially, but this is true for uh, some of the other rates as well across the Coast Guard, the things that we have them responsible for. You know, we have them responsible for everything from these tiny little outboards on these tiny little skiffs all the way up to 400 plus foot ships. And while it's all technically engineering and, and most of us can and will adapt when required to, 
There's some different skill sets. Um, I, I was doing a boat maintenance facility early on in my career. Um, I did one deployment to, to CENTCOM. And I remember the first time we pulled the top off of an outboard and I started looking at the components in there and I was like, what, what is this stuff? And the guys, you know, pointed, that's a fuel pump right there. And I was like, but it's, it's so tiny. Like, how can that possibly move all the fuel we need? And it's just not familiar. Um, yeah. So it's a little bit easier on the mechanic and it gives you a little bit more chance to develop um, the, you know, understand the quirks of the pieces of equipment that you're working on, how they tend to behave. Um, You know, something doesn't like being run this way, but if you throttle this valve in a quarter, you know, a quarter turn or so, all of a sudden it's magical. Those are the kinds of things that, that really take you from, you know, competent mechanic to master mechanic. And if we continually ask our folks to go from a small boat station to a major cutter to something else entirely, we're asking them to start over again several times in their career. And I I don't know that there's a perfect way um, because it's tempting to just say like, okay, we have big ships and we have little boats and we have the stuff in between and we're gonna break people up in between that. That may or may not make sense. But we could also look at it as like, hey, you know, our guys in the in the auxiliary gangs on most of the cutters, they're focused on very similar pieces of equipment. They're focused on refrigeration units. They're focused on um, air conditioning units and air compressors and and davits and some of these other things that they may not be identical uh, ship to ship or, or class to class, but they're similar enough that it, you're already one step ahead when you're starting to work on them. So maybe we, we talk about having our folks specialize a little because we're a small service and we can't afford to you know, have a very, very niche expert in only one thing, but to have them start to see some of the same stuff over and over again throughout their career. And then you know, we do have certain schools. We have a Honda Outboard School. We have some other schools that we run organically within the training center at Yorktown for our technicians. But if we train them, in the middle of a tour, and then they never come back to that that type of equipment, if they never go to another platform that has it, we've only got a year or so's worth of return on investment on uh, on that person and that training. So I think the, the way to maximize that is to kind of start to look at what are the areas that you can <clears throat> specialize in and, and how do we get our folks to focus there, which is not saying that you can never jump. Just understand that, you know, like an aircraft mechanic going from a rotary wing to a fixed wing platform, it's it's going to be a significant jump. Right, right. And and uh, is your recommendation in this area uh, for both enlisted and officers or is it specifically or, or more specific to the enlisted rates? I think the way that the Coast Guard does does officers and expects EOs to be a little bit more of managers of engineering, it's probably not as applicable to them. Um, I mean, this is the stuff, like I said, that's really down in the weeds. Um, I I worked on some ships that were fortunate to have chief engineers that had been on for 20 years on that platform. And and we'd have these little things where the plant wasn't working quite right and it was it was doing something funky and it wasn't enough to call for help. And I distinctly remember one of my watches, chief engineer came down just kind of looked around, was doing his round, walked over to a piece of equipment that I had not suspected in the least was my problem, made a small adjustment and all the problems melted away. And for the rest of my watch, it was beautiful. And I just remember watching him leave and thinking that is the last thing I would have come up with to fix this problem. But he knew he'd seen it before. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the the legends of, of engineers who know their plants Mm -hmm. well and can, you know, even in their sleep, right. They'll wake up and go, something's just a little, and you know, come down and tweak it or tell, you know, that I, I love those stories. That's a good, good one. Her next recommendation uh, really resonated and that was bring electronics technicians into the engine room, which has to do with the fact that a lot of complex engineering systems today have very complex electronic control systems. Uh, so talk about the example that you give from the icebreaker, the Polar Star. Sure. It's uh, Polar Star, even though she's one of our our older assets, um, she's a very complex plant. So you've got three shafts and each shaft has two motor generators and a turbine that are capable of driving it. And you can actually kind of mix and match a little bit and put one, uh, you know, one shaft on a turbine and two shafts on the generators or, or play around with it for whatever's, you know, appropriate for what they're doing. And that that control system that allows that to happen really um, seamlessly for the engineers, you know, it's as simple as a, as a few clicks, 
um, is, is pretty impressive, but it's also pretty extensive. You're bringing in a lot of sensors and <clears throat> you're, um, you have a lot of, of monitoring going on in addition to all the activation controls. And so the way that Polar Star has, has decided to handle that is that they have a controls group division in addition to the other traditional shops that are in there. And that controls group division has an electronics technician. That, that, that is their entire job. And they get some assistance from a couple of senior electricians mates, which is, is helpful because it's a lot for one person at any given time. Um, but that whole world of um, the, you know, from the, from the individual sensors to the activation controls, the data acquisition units, all of that, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work and it fits more naturally with the electronics technician uh, rating than it does with the EMs. And so um, the, you know, I'm not, I'm not arguing to bring all of the ETs into the engine department. Certainly there's still plenty of work for them with the combat systems and the radar and, and the other things that we have. Um, but today's plants, the ships that were, the classes of ships that we're building now, they utilize an industrial IT and that, that comprises a lot of different communications networks. You know, you're talking about things like Profibus and Modbus and Canbus and Ethernet and, and different software systems that go in there, as well as the communications methods and the different subcomponents that are needed for all of that signal to be transmitted. That fits more traditionally with the electronics technicians. Um, and our electricians maids who are, who are currently trying to handle this, they're, you know, they're responsible for the, some of the simpler things like lighting, which can be a massive burden in and of itself, just keeping all the lamps on the ship functioning the way they're supposed to. Um, but they're also heavily involved in electrical controllers because there's a lot of components, uh, ventilation fans and, and other things that you don't typically think of that have an electrical controller system in there. Um, that the electricians may spend a lot of time working on. And so they have this tremendous load already. Bringing someone in that speaks a little bit more of the data side and the electronics and the, the finer components um, is really a natural fit. And it's, it's worked out pretty well for Polar Star, keep her up and running. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you also wrote that the Coast Guard should dive deep with the experts and give more to get more. So explain those ideas a bit. So those two ideas are really heavily related. And, and the first one, this idea of diving deep, is that that's the key, that's the real key to getting engineers trained and competent and taking someone from an introductory level to a, a very proficient level. If, um, if you're a really good engineer, you have a 3D model of your equipment kind of built in your head from the time that you've spent with it. And so, you know, when I'm standing outside of a, of a diesel engine, I'm looking for the things on the outside that, that anchor me to how it's oriented. You know, the valve covers and the, the turbochargers and the charge air coolers and all those pieces of things I can see from the outside. And then as I spend more time with it, I know that if I pick up the valve cover, there's going to be rocker arms and a fuel injector underneath. And I'm going to have, you know, if I go underneath the head level, then I've got the pistons and, and I know how those bolt to the rods. And, and you can visualize that piece of equipment so that when something doesn't sound right, doesn't act right, the pressures are off, the temperatures are off, without having to stop and disassemble the entire thing, you can kind of make some intuitive uh, decisions about what the problem probably is. You know, and they're really good mechanics. They can they can order their spare parts before they ever start tearing into it if they're they're super confident in what they've got. So that skill set is essential to really excelling as an engineer. But the only way to build it is to see the equipment disassembled multiple times. And and you don't really typically get a chance to do that disassembly, especially with the way that the military does maintenance, unless you're in port. Um, so it's invaluable. It really helps. But if you step back and look at the bigger picture, we're then saying that we want you to do this really heavy maintenance and get in there and, and experience everything taken down to nuts and bolts. But we're asking you to do it on the time that's traditionally been your home time. So we're, we're asking you to do a 30, 60, 90 day deployment and then come home and work six, seven days a week doing long days, heavy work, hard work. Um, and that's not an attractive proposition, especially if I ask you to try and come and do it for two, three, four years straight. So 
in order to get this very critical skill, we've got to give something back to people. And <clears throat> bonuses are a, are a nice start. Um, it does make it a little bit better. But as a parent of young children, I have never in my life been more aware of the importance of time. And so I really think the thing that we need to give back to folks is is that time that we're taking from them. And so, you know, we're saying that, hey, when you're on board, we expect seven day work weeks, we expect long days, we expect you to be in it and dirty and working. But the trade off is when you're done with that, you're going to do a turnover with your relief, shake their hand and go rest, recover, recuperate, you know, climb a mountain, go surfing, whatever it is that, that restores your soul. So that when your vacation time or your and their work time is done, you come back to be that relief, ready to go, ready to get stuff done. <clears throat> and so it, that's kind of the emotionally healthier balance. And, and that's a strong piece from the Merchant Marine. And, and one of the things that, that really stuck with me when I talked to the Canadian Coast Guard was, you know, they said they had gone to this model of dual crewing 20 some odd years ago. And wow. that if they tried to go back to conventional crewing today, they would lose 90% of their force because, because that free time, that ability to like, I'm leaving the home port of the ship and I'm going off to the Eastern or Western edges of the country to go do, you know, farming or whatever it is that I really love is that important to them as a retention, uh, as a retention piece. You know, did you get any sense from talking to Canadians? How do they afford that? Because, you know, I mean, I, I can I, I can picture what you're saying and I, it sounds fantastic. Um, but I can also picture, you know, senior Coast Guard admirals going, yeah, but we can't afford two times as many people as we currently have in the Coast Guard. Right. I mean, so that's the the practical aspect of it. I, I don't know how you wrap your head around that. And maybe it's for somebody way above our pay grades. Right. Certainly. Um, certainly not something Commander Baryon has the decision making ability to enact. But um, in the short term, I think it would look a little bit different. I kind of talked about this in the article where we may actually just pull crews from assets and, and you know, say that we're going to put one asset off to the side and run another one a little bit harder to get the same number of operational days um, and then focus both crews on that platform. Um, in the long term, though, I really strongly believe that 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 time off, if it's if it's real, if it's not like, yeah, you get to go home a couple hours early, you know, today, and that's your that's your comp time. Um, if it's a real time off bonus, I think that becomes the attraction in and of itself. And working out in the Merchant Marine, um, we're not bound to to continue on a ship uh, seagoing career. And so we have guys that are periodically, for various reasons, looking to come ashore and go to shore jobs. And the number of times that I've heard my fellow mariners say something along the lines of, yeah, it's close to home, it's got all these pros, but I have to work 50 weeks a year and I'm not going to get paid the same for, for working more hours. So, you know, um, that keeps a lot of guys coming to sea in addition to some of the other awesome things about going to sea, because that's a, that's a fun career in and of itself. But, but having that time um, and not working, you know, six months straight and then getting a couple weeks off and then another six months straight, which, you know, that's an exaggeration, but not having to do something like that, that's the draw that brings people out to sea. And a lot of the guys I know that are, that are lifers, the 20, 30 year guys, they're like, yeah, I just, I can't see giving up my vacation. <laughs> Got so it. it's, it's got a draw to it. And the, the Canadians, um, the way that they they handled it was accounting wise. They worked a 12 hour day on the ship and they paid you for six. And so you got your six hours back officially as comp time for all the days that you weren't on the ship. So there's some there's definitely some legal ramifications we'd have to look into and accountability and, um, you know, how to make sure that we're not going outside the bounds of liberty that can be granted and some of the other rules that we have. But I do think it's possible if we take a hard look at it. Yeah, and, and this echoes a lot of things that, that we're hearing uh, on the Navy side, too, with uh, uh, ship maintenance, submarine maintenance, uh, particularly uh, the backlogs from uh, shipyards and that, you know, people expect to go to sea. They expect to work hard at sea. Uh, they expect to do, you know, some maintenance work, et cetera, and shipyard things are uh, part of the it's part of the the equation, but it's very disappointing, very hard on retention. 
and hard on you know anybody that uh, that the that the time in the shipyard tends to be longer hours, one and three sec you know duty sections uh, and and you know just. A, a grind, you know, that can be a cup instead of being now some of these shipyard availabilities expected to be, you know, 10, 12 months are turning into 24 to 30 month grinds. And that's, you know, it's, it is a, um, a, a real drag on retention and morale and a, a lot of different issues. So it's certainly something that's got to be resolved. Uh, it sounds like in the Coast Guard and, and definitely uh, in the Navy as well. That's a good point. Um, Toward the end, and this touches on what you just said, but you know, toward the end of the article, you mentioned that uh, the world's largest cruise ships operate 50 or more weeks per year at sea. How do they maintain that level of readiness and, and what lessons from the commercial shipping and cruise lines uh, would you apply to the Coast Guard? Well, I mean, if we're being honest, cruise ships have a tremendous profit motive um, because more so than even a standard cargo ship, if they're not carrying passengers, not only are they not making money, they're racking up expenses because you still have to pay the crew and the fuel and all of the other things that go into that. So for a cruise ship, the ideal is 52 weeks a year carrying passengers. They don't want any downtime whatsoever. And a couple of the ways that they minimize it is anything that that absolutely must be done in a dry dock is consolidated into, into a dry dock. And when you come in, you're hitting all of those things as fast as possible to get them done and get back out. Anything that can possibly done in the, be done in the water is done in the water. And then you start asking, well, if it can be done in the water, why can't it be done underway? And, and so a lot of the times, you know, if they're installing a new attraction or they're putting something up for the passengers, they may cordon off an area and say, sorry, folks, you know, for this cruise, this area is closed. And then behind the scenes, you'll have a whole crew of people putting in the ice skating rink or whatever it is they've decided that, that needs to be on there at that point. Um, but the, the heart of it, the way that you can keep the ship running, um, even through all of that, is they use rotating crews. And they have various schedules. Um, some of the ones that I would consider the worst are guys that are working five months on, one month off. But you get all the way up to the permanent employees, the more senior guys that are working even time. So maybe 60 days on, 60 days off and coming back and forth. And then the other thing that they try to do, um, definitely within their fleets, if nothing else, is they try to bring people back to the same ships because you're, you're looking at the same equipment, you're looking at the same procedures, the learning curve is, is not nearly as steep as going from say, you know, a 200 foot river cruiser to a thousand foot, you know, mega ship. So they, they do some things there with the, with the people and they use um, either a union or a hiring agency to make sure that they will always, you know, if someone gets hurt or someone needs to go home or something happens where your perfectly planned schedule doesn't work out, they have a bench and they're, they can pull another qualified mariner to come in. And yes, that person may take a couple weeks to get up to speed, but they've got someone that's, that's already kind of ready to go. And then the last thing that's kind of critical is they make ship design choices that allow for that level of, redundancy and work to be done underway. So, you know, if you need four generators in your diesel electric plant to make C-speed, you're going to install six um, or, or five at a minimum, because you want to have that ability to completely tear one down and not affect your timing on your schedule whatsoever. Mm. Um, you know, you need two fuel oil purifiers, definitely going to install three. You need one lube oil purifier per generator. Well, we'll put in crossover piping so that, you know, you can run one to two of them if one of them goes down and you don't have to lose the engine. Um, so there is some, there is some things that they're much more easily able to do at the scale that they're doing. I mean, it's super easy to add more equipment when you've got 900 feet of ship to work with and you're trying to get more weight down below anyways. Um, and that's that's a challenge for the Coast Guard, right? Because we don't we don't build very big ships, and we still have to fit a certain amount of equipment in there. Uh, but but that approach of the redundancy and saying, hey, this pump may not be perfect for this application, but if we put in crossover piping, that'll give us a, a last ditch backup. So it empowers the crew. I and mean, we took we took everything down while we were running. We almost never disrupted the schedule if we could help it. Um, to just try and, and keep everything going so that, you know, again, to the passengers and even to the, um, the non-maritime staff, they never thought about how the ship moved, what was going on or, or anything that we were doing down below. 
Um, and then, you know, to your question about, about the lessons, I think the biggest single lesson um, that I would love to impart from the Merchant Marine to the Coast Guard is that we have to train our people as if no one is coming to help them. It's fantastic that we can provide the level of support that we do, that they can pick up a phone and call for help. And, you know, maybe one day they'll have the, the VR goggles to be able to, to have a technician looking over their shoulder and going, oh, yeah, no, that's, that's your problem right there. Those are great aspirations, but they shouldn't be our baseline because we send ships very far away from land and everything else. We work in environments that are periodically non-communicative. And a lot of times with engineering, when things go south, they go south so fast, you barely have time to explain to the person standing next to you what's happening, let alone get somebody on the phone and go, what should I do right now? So we really need to equip our folks if we want to avoid these big disasters and we want to increase resiliency and make sure that our ships will run come hell or high water. We need to train our folks as if no one's coming to help them. Well put, really well put. Well, we are out of time. Uh, my guest today has been Commander Kelsey Berry and U.S. Coast Guard. Her article is the winning article in the, it's titled The Elephant in the Engine Room. It's in the August issue of Proceedings, and it is the winning, winning essay from this year's Coast Guard essay contest. So Kelsey, congrats again. Great having you on the show. You are an incredibly articulate very bright and, and uh, you know, the, the combination of an articulate engineer who writes well. <laughs> a pretty thing. I know a lot of smart engineers, uh, but who can't write well, but you've written very well. And uh, this is just a terrific article and I commend it to all of our listeners. It's great to have you on the show today and, and thanks for your time. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873. Our members have fostered the free and open debate that has moved the sea, sor sea services forward. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. If you're already a member, invite a friend to join. Until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.